Hi everyone, it is David, and I have a special short uh, discussion I want to have today that focuses solely on school safety training drills. And today is January 16th, 2016. It's chilly. It's going to be way below zero with a wind chill of 20 to 25 below tonight. So if you're watching this video and, and it's much warmer outside, um, be very thankful because the next couple of days here are going to be cold. But uh, I had an opportunity today to meet with um, Chaplain Mark Goldsworthy. And Mark works with the Portage Police Department and is a ordained non denominational chaplain. Does much in the greater Portage community. Um, wonderful man and actually today Mark was coordinating the community um, no-cost lunch held at Cooper Hall and Mark and I have uh, worked on that together for a couple of years um, but the, the credit really goes to Mark on that. And Mark had shared with me today that this week he had participated in a multi-agency safety training drill held at um, the old county nursing facility, nursing home. So you can imagine um, multi-floors and many, many rooms. So perfect place to do this. And Mark played the role of hostage and shared his experiences. It was something new for him. Uh, but he has some interesting insights that he's going to share. So I am going to clip in with my software here a short 10-minute interview that I did with Mark about his experiences. And what I want to really have you think about as you listen to Mark and as you engage in safety roles within your own district, uh, there's a few points. Um, one is that... In the event of an actual school shooting or intruder, uh, when police come in, they are not going to be able to distinguish you from the potential uh, shooter. So if you run out into the hallway, if you're looking through the window and the, and the police are walking up and you say, my kids, my kids are in here, I need to get them out. Um, what is likely going to happen is you'll be told to put your hands up and someone might grab you and put you up against the wall and put your hands behind your back. I say that because I actually had that happen to me in a simulation with a police department a few years ago where um, I came running out of a room and they weren't expecting it. This was all planned. They were coming into a, a school for an active shooter um, potential situation. Again, this was all done as a drill. But uh, what they did is they quickly grabbed me because I'm running toward them and, and put me up against the wall. And I can still feel a little creaking from that. But the point is, um, no matter what, you have your name badge, you have your, your shirt with the school logo. When the police enter that building, um, they are not going to be able to distinguish you from the potential shooter or whoever is, is causing the violence. We also get this assumption that there is one shooter or there, there's one person involved. And Mark, Mark talked about that, and I talks about that in his presentation, I believe, a little bit. But he talked to me about that, too, where we have to remember it could be two, three, four individuals involved. So just because you've identified the, me one individual doesn't mean that there aren't others in the building. So... That was something very apparent after the Virginia Tech shooting. Um, the sweeping of Norris Hall took hours and hours and hours. Um, but I've worked with school districts that have gone through shooter situations, um, authentic shooter situations within the district. A few points that I'm going to share. One is staff will need to, one, anticipate they're not getting back into their room that day or probably for a few days. So if they have personal materials, car keys, credit cards, jacket, whatever, that's going to stay wherever it's at because that's a, 
crime scene now. People are not going to be able to go out to their cars, even escort it. They're not going to be able to go out to their cars. You'll see a yellow tape barrier put up around the parking lot. And until the police go through and check everything and everything for evidence, um, folks aren't going to be able to get their cars. After the school shooting in Marinette, uh, what happened was uh, buses were brought in to take people home, but their vehicles were left in the parking lot for a few days until then they were able to come back and, and um, reclaim, reclaim their vehicles. So this is a point where obviously school staff and just for anyone, um, I, you overlook. You, you don't anticipate that if something happens to a sentinel degree like this, that you're not going to be going back into your classroom and grabbing your items in two hours and heading home. Uh, you're not going to be, yeah, starting up your, your car and taking off. You know, the whole area is going to become a crime investigation scene. And also, you know, when police come in to the building, they will not be able to distinguish you. And they're taught, they're taught, they're instructed to not distinguish you from the shooter, you know, just by first sight. Likely what would happen is they would take you, they would, you know, ask you questions, double check some ID, and then, and then move you to safety from that standpoint. But these are discussions that typically don't happen during safety drills. This is the part that's left off. And I think it's very important for you as a school administrator to include that in, you know, three minutes at the end of your presentation of saying, by the way, if something like this did happen, did happen, this is likely how it will directly impact you. And then I think staff obviously would have an understanding of, okay, I understand. I'm not going to be able to get out to my car and, and to get my things and, um, you know, that I'm going to, have to arrange for other transportation or that, that people be working with me and, and so forth. And also the, how alarming and unsettling it can be for a staff member, you know, if they come out in the hallway and they're trying to help the police to be, you know, immediately, um, you know, maybe down on the ground or hands up and then, you know, checked for any weapons and things like that. Again, uh, how much of a shock, and, and, and for me, that was an extreme, um, you know, extremely unsettling situation. I've, I've been through this, um, you know, in, in drills numerous times, but it's all for safety. And I think if you work with staff ahead of time on that, that after that happens, they, they understand it, they process it, and they understand, okay, I understand why this happened. But if they're, if, uh, if you don't do that step, I think, there can really be the potential for, um, you know, for some psychological instability, especially in that in that short term, of why was I treated this way? So, um, wanted to again just pass that on. I want you to include that in your safety drills, or at least at some debriefing, at some point to go over that with staff. And let's listen to this video with Mark. Thank you. Good, so we are recording uh, January 16th, it is a Saturday, 2016. So uh, I am with Mark and Mark recently participated in a safety uh, training which occurred in a three-story structure which is no longer in use, uh, has numerous um, rooms in it. And one of the things uh, that Mark got to do is participate as a victim and was very observant as to some of the things that were happening and some of the things that weren't happening with the different um, agencies, police agencies, and so forth coming in and, and sweeping the scene. So Mark, can you, can you tell me about that, what that experience was like? Absolutely. Um, this exercise were, was dealing with an active shooter scenario. Um, it was a countywide exercise, so we had local uh, uh, police officers, we had people from, other, from the county, um, we had FBI there, um, and basically what it was is we had set up a scenario where an individual was, had broken into a, a building, he had a gun, 
and the officers, the immediate officers, two or three of them were responding. They didn't have time uh, to call in a negotiator, um, and uh, the, what they had to deal with was a, a large area, um, lots of rooms, and they had no idea what they were going to find, who they were going to, who they were going to find, or how many people. Um, my role was to play a hostage. And there was one other person who was deemed the, the bad guy. Um, he had a gun. I, I did not. I was a hostage. But uh, I was being held in one of the many rooms. And uh, the officers who were tasked to eliminate or to neutralize, I should say, the bad guy and to uh, hopefully come out of there with me still alive, they had to determine who the bad guy was, and I think that's the most difficult part of it. Yeah, so, so you were telling me at one point they came in and sometimes they would, just because you were grabbing your side or that you were down, would anticipate that you were the victim, and you shared it with me. Actually, you could have just been a partner to um, you know one of the, the folks that was involved in, in the um, in the shooting and that you were just playing this role and then as soon as a, an officer would put their guard down you could you could ambush them or something like that. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, the officers did not know what they were going into. They did not necessarily know that it was a hostage situation. Um, when they came into the room what they saw was one of the individuals had a gun. The bad guy had a gun. I was in the corner yelling, don't shoot, don't shoot, but they do not know if I am a bad guy or if I'm a good guy, if I'm a victim or not. So what was interesting was to see how the different agencies responded to me. Um, some of the agencies took it for granted that because I did not have a weapon in my hands, it was not a weapon visible, that I was indeed a hostage or a victim and actually turned their back to me which was something they should not have done because in reality I may have had a gun but but hidden on my body um, so that was something that they had learned that even though I was indeed a victim they needed to take the precautions pat me down put me in cuffs ne if necessary and ask me the questions that would determine whether or not I was the bad guy or if I was a victim or hostage so, Mark, one of the things that, that you shared with me, and I'm going to be using this with, with um, K-12 educators, they should not, um, I, I guess, they, they should anticipate if there is something that would happen in a school, that if police come in, they're not going to know necessarily if that person is a teacher or an aide, and they might say, you know, you need to be on the ground, we are going to handcuff you, and... Um, until we get information otherwise to determine that you're not a threat. Uh, because I think people really um, wouldn't think that would happen. They would just think the police would come in and say, okay, you are, you're not one of the bad guys, so you can go on your own. And it, it's really probably not going to be that way. Absolutely correct. I know I'm a good guy, and so it would be nice to believe that the police officers responding know that too, but they don't. They don't know if I'm a good guy or a bad guy. So they have to take precautions to neutralize any threat. And at that point, even though I don't have a weapon visible, I would still be considered a threat. So it was necessary to tell me to lay down on the ground, show, me, show them my hands. And then they, all of them were gentle when they, they placed me in cuffs. Then they asked me questions, who I was, what I was doing there. Tell me about the shooter. Were there any other shooters? Did I know anything? And at that point, they could determine whether or not I was, in fact, um, a good guy or a bad guy. But but I do know what you're saying. It would have been nice for them to just say, hey, you know, we recognize you're the good guy. You can go. But they, they cannot do that. Yeah. So so my, my you know, point in working with, uh, with administrators who are going to be working with safety is that they, they need to remind staff that in a dynamic situation such as what you're talking about, police uh, are not going to be identifying um, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. Every person needs to be secured, you know, for the safety of that situation. And 
that is probably going to be a very overwhelming experience for some people, but it is done for the safety of the situation. You, you mentioned one more thing to me. Um, you might be questioned of saying, what was the, the bad guy wearing? And, uh, and Mark, you, you shared uh, color blindness is, is something that, um, that you have. So you might see something in a different color than what obviously was there so an officer could say, oh, that's not right. It was this color. Right. There was one situation, one of the scenarios that we played out where I was placed in handcuffs and the officer was questioning me, what did the shooter wear? What was he wearing? He wanted a positive identification on the shooter. And I am colorblind. And, and so I, I was nervous about getting the question wrong. I, I said, well, his, his jacket was gray. It could have been green. It could have been, could have been blue for all I know. Um, so I was very nervous at that point. Even though it was a scenario, I'm going to get this question wrong. What, what, what's going to happen to me if, if, if I do get it wrong? But um, I, I guess I guess right. I guess you know it was a great jacket, and uh, but that was something the the officers couldn't. Uh, uh, it was something they wouldn't have been prepared for. Was that the person they're questioning is actually colorblind, so they can't tell them the color of the jacket the shooter was wearing. So my my takeaway on this, and I appreciate you sharing your experience, is um, just to remind people that. If there is an active shooter situation or some sentinel event of someone coming in who's doing harm, and also the fact that it, it might not just be one person, there could be multiple people, so that's why um, as, as police go through that they might be putting people into cuffs or into a certain area just until they can figure out and secure that, that environment. Uh, because again, this is something I think can be very upsetting to staff. Uh, but again, it is for the safety of the entire situation. Um, so, and and afterwards, you debriefed and and things went well. You felt that you were able to give your input to to the team. Yeah, it was it was a it was a good it was a good scenario. Um, a lot of it was being able to understand what happens when you're placed in a stressful stressful situation like that. Um, your body change. Your body does things you don't. It doesn't normally do. You start experiencing tunnel vision. You don't hear the things you normally hear. You're not aware of things that you normally be aware of. In one scenario, we had a hand grenade placed practically in front of an open door, and if you were not in a stressful situation, you'd walk by that door and you'd see that hand grenade, and you there's a hand grenade sitting right there. But in almost all the situations where these police officers ran this scenario, almost every single team missed that grenade. In fact, one person tripped over it and didn't know he had tripped over. And this is all due to the stress that they were experiencing. And uh, <clears throat> also to add, one of the things that was surprising was in one scenario, I was actually a wounded victim who uh, had been shot in the stomach. And to most, you would hope that the police officers arriving on the scene would administer aid immediately. But it's, it's not necessarily the case. They need to eliminate the threat first. And so they actually left me there for a while, eliminated the, the threat, and then came back and administered first aid to me. It was a little disconcerting, but you have to understand that until the threat is eliminated, then even the police officers' lives are in danger. <clears throat> Okay, well, Mark, this has been extremely uh, helpful today, and, and this is something you went through just a, a few days ago, right? Yeah, just okay. a few days ago. Just a few days ago, and I, I think it reiterates that county agencies, uh, police from um, the local police department, sheriff's department, that the training, working together, uh, it just becomes much, and more, much more of an efficient process. And what you highlighted is a step that I think is sometimes overlooked in schools, and that's giving people the opportunity for feedback. When schools have um, active shooter drills and doors are locked and, and so forth, what typically doesn't happen enough is the opportunity to sit down afterwards and to get feedback from everybody involved. And, and the scenario you're talking about, I think the feedback was extremely helpful. And, and that's something as, as I work through the course um, that I'm instructing right now, I'm going to remind people of after you do something, um, a drill to this extent. Make sure you're gathering feedback from everybody that was involved. So, well, I appreciate it, sir.
Uh, thank You're you welcome. for your, your time and also for your, your great work. And um, again, I will be using this video for the benefit of uh, aspiring administrators learning how to keep their schools safe. So thank you again, Mark. You're welcome. Okay, fascinating, fascinating video from, from Mark. Uh, appreciated his insight. And something to close out this discussion, um, Mark had the opportunity to be participating in the debriefing following this drill. And how often do you really do a debriefing after a safety drill, after a lockdown? Are you going around asking people, how did it, how did it go, whatever that meant? Um, is it just the administrative team of saying this is how we, we perceive things went, we checked doors, um, made sure that people were out of sight and so forth? Or are you asking people through a survey that you're sending out immediately afterwards that goes to teachers that might have, you know, just a few questions on it? Did you know what to do? Um, you know, where your, your location was? Was there anything that, that you felt could be improved? Um, and, and, and just some things like that that immediately gets back so then the administrative team can process that, maybe summarize it together and, and reflect that back out to staff at a staff meeting or even in a day or two in an email coming back to staff. Very timely. This is what you need to do, though, very timely um, and very concise. Get it back to staff and say, um, here are some things that staff, you know, that you said went well. Here's some areas that you'd like us to look at of maybe um, approaching it in a different way, and and here's some things that that could have could have helped you. When staff get that type of feedback, and you do it within 24 to 48 hours of doing that drill, that definitely gives you credibility as an administrator that you're reviewing uh, the information they're submitting, and that you're taking that under consideration to develop a better plan. And I would say do that too with students to some level, which might be, it doesn't have to be an entire student body survey. I think that's probably over the top. Um, but at least a few focus groups or even to have teachers ask their students um, if they understood what was going on. And that can be part of the survey that goes to the teachers of saying, you know, please um, respond to the survey by tomorrow and ask some of your students if they understood the drill, like did they understand when it was announced what they were supposed to do? Did they understand they weren't supposed to or were supposed to be able to use a cell phone? Um, did they understand uh, the, the purpose of the drill and um, what would happen, for example, if they, they didn't follow the, the process, the risk that, that they could put themselves at or, or others? And just in, in general, you know, do they, what questions do they have or what purpose do they see in this? If you can do that and put that maybe into that teacher survey and reflect it back out, you have different groups, you know, student council, or you can do it over the announcements or during student advisories and, and, and put some of that stuff back out, maybe some student focus groups. Even maybe do a PBIS video. Who knows? You know, a short PBIS video on... Um, you know, lockdowns and appropriate um, behaviors and responses of students during lockdowns. And then also, you know, what students, you know, have thought about lockdowns, questions they've had, and because of the questions that they've generated, some of the changes maybe that the school has made because of lockdowns. This all comes back in a way to my research on student code of silence, where the biggest thing with students when you ask them with administrators, what do you want? One, they want to be heard. They want to be heard. And the second is, if they have suggestions, they, they want to know that those suggestions have been considered. They don't have to be agreed, act, acted upon, but that they know that they have been considered, that they know that they've been acknowledged. Um, so I, I definitely think those are pieces of a safety system in a safety drill that are missing. And I don't know if you need to do that every time, but I, I would do that maybe twice a year at least to send that survey out and right away at the start of the year. Um, and some people will definitely point out things like, there were some students in the hallway in this area and I wasn't sure, like, should I go out and bring them into my room? And then, but yeah, that's not where they're supposed to be this hour, so how are they accounted for? 
or what if we have some students who are off campus, um, you know, for any reason, you know, they're, they're a block away at a park or something like that collecting leaves and all of a sudden this happens. How do they know not to come back to the building and, and so forth? But, um, you know, Mark, Mark spent a lot of time in the briefing and one of the things that he had shared back was that as different police um, agencies went through, you know, some were very focused on his well-being, um, such as, as the gunshot when he talked about as a first priority, and others were very focused upon making sure that he was in cuffs and secured and then treating him and, and then working through and talking with him. Because as Mark said, maybe he was one of the bad guys and he was telling me this, what if I was a bad, a bad guy, I was part of this, and during this whole incident, something went wrong and one of my partners turned on me and shot me. Um, and you know, maybe what if I have a weapon that, that is by my side that the officer doesn't see. So, you know, these are, these are things, and again, law enforcement is invite them into your building when you do these drills. But then again, as an administrative team, seeking that feedback from staff. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you and would, again, strongly urge that what I'm talking about, you incorporate this into your drills because it is missing probably in 90% in of the drills that I have seen as, as both a student services director and a consultant. Um, a big, big missing piece that is very easy to put in. And as far as survey, what I would do, I put together a Google Docs survey. And then it's easy for people to get in the data to be um, culminated and then with a click of a button, you know, to get that out to some different people. So it doesn't have to be hard. Um, well, I appreciate your time. I am down here in the, the freezer, which uh, is a, you know what, it's about 54. So between yesterday and today, we haven't lost much for temperature. I don't think it's really gotten below 50 down here, no matter how cold it gets outside. It's one of those underground things. Um, you can only get so cold. So please uh, be a leader in safety. And if these discussions aren't coming up amongst your safety team, bring them up and also think about inclusion. Think about how are you going to get the opinions, the input of students with disabilities, your students with learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and how the drill went for them. And you might have to have the uh, teacher or maybe some support staff uh, help fill in some of that information, but make sure that you're not overlooking your students with disabilities when you're evaluating the effectiveness of a program and not from your perception of how it went for them, but from their first person perception of how this drill went for them. Thank you.